may cross disorders that are somewhat unusual and where the repertoire of infections is very limited. So there is a group of conditions which predispose an individual to a very narrow spectrum of um, infections. For instance, uh, tuberculosis, salmonella, and these children otherwise remain quite well. This group of disorders was first... Uh, Smile, please. 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 Smile. Acknowledgement. Please. 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 This group of disorders was first described uh, within uh, a, 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 a few years of the first description, first from London and then from Paris. So the case that was admitted at the Great Ormond Street uh, Children's Hospital, this was a child from Malta, born to consanguineous parents and who had atypical mycobacterial infection of the spine. At that time, no one had any clue as to why this patient is having atypical mycobacterial infection. It took several years uh, for this defect to be identified. And Dr. Mike Levine uh, was the uh, physician working on this patient who first described this condition. And shortly thereafter, the group led by Dr. Casanova from Paris also described this condition uh, in greater detail. These are unusual conditions. We don't get to see them very often. They are relatively more difficult to characterize because the, uh, there are several immune defects which can result in predisposition to uh, these kinds of tubercular, tubercular infections. And the case that we will be discussing today is an incredibly difficult case. And I think we must congratulate uh, the team at Cochin led by Dr. Jason, Dr. Sagar, for having worked out the molecular defect in this patient. And I think it's particularly apt that IAP Cochin is presenting this patient because the first case of uh, this group of immune deficiency, which we now call MSMD, Mendelian Susceptibility, uh, Mendelian susceptibility to mycobacterial disease, MSMD, which previously was known as a defect of the IL-12 interferon gamma axis. The first case in India with this disorder came from Cochin. And the pediatrician who diagnosed this case is there with us today, Dr. Sheila Namputri. So she, she had uh, the patients she had the courage to keep on uh, working up on this patient. And it took us, I think, a couple of years before we were able to you know, jointly come at some kind of a diagnosis. And ultimately, I think we had to send the sample to Dr. Casanova. But to Dr. Sheila goes the credit for picking up the first patient of MSMD in India and for publishing it. So over to you, Dr. Jason. Thank you, Dr. Surjit Singh, for this uh, introduction. We go into the story of Z. Z is a, was a six-month baby who presented a non-healing ulcer and escorted at the PCG site for two months. It had, the patient had increased over the last over two weeks, and he had generalized urticaria for two days. He's been treated with topical mucosine and oral antibiotics like home, moxiclav and cephalexin with no relief. There was absolutely no fever. The child was playful, was feeding well, and was growing well. He had an un uneven full perinatal history. Birth weight is 2.8 kilos. He was given a PCG of 0.1 ml infradermally on the third postnatal day, which was a little higher than what we normally give. We thought it was because of that initially. There was a history of TB spine in the grandmother five years 
uh, and was treated, she was treated for five years to get rid of her TB spine. The father's saga is something that Dr. Sony Warki, who's here with us, has uh, been with this, this father for the last for the, for the last 28 to 30 years. He uh, had the TB spine at two and a half years and was treated immediately as primary complex at uh, around two and a half, three years. He had a chronic skin condition which lasted for the last 28 years. He still has it. Started at two years of age and has slowly progressed patches on the back, recurring and becoming larger. He's been biopsied 26 times. And a lesion of the prepuce was removed at five years of age. The first biopsy was at 15 years of age. There was 10 AFPs in the entire smear. But, uh, and another at KMC had a few AFPs also shown. But both of them, the histopathology showed granulomatous dermatitis and the diagnosis was lupus vulgaris. This was, he was but treated with antitypical treatment. While the treatment is, goes on, it, it flares up and becomes worse. Huge areas of the lesion were excised at one point of time and grafted to no avail. The lesion would recur on the grafted uh, skin. ATT was given, but this lesion, as I only said, became more fiery and extensive. He had 12 years of ATT over the, over the last 25 years. And the only response was to minocycline. He was treated at the Corte Medical College. He was treated at Ames. He was treated at John's, KMC, Manipal, and uh, Hinduja Hospital. He was diagnosed with lupus vulgaris, LCH, colloid Hansen, sarcoidosis, mycosis of various uh, types were the diagnosis. And he was treated with steroids, even pulse steroids, isotretinoids. Uh, 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 retinoin, acetracin, uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine, azathioprine, and methotrexate, and whatnot. No order of treatment has been given. It reduces for a time being and then comes back again. Finally, minocycline and cotrimoxone was started again by Dr. Sony. Sony had given minocycline for one month when he was two, two, two and a half or uh, tw uh, three years of age, tw sorry, 12 years of age, and had some relief at the point of time. Then a three-month course again was by him. Some relief for the patient went off to various other uh, hospitals and came back at the age of 23. And that time, it was restarted on minocycline and cotrimoxol. And this is his pictures. After the cotrimoxol, I mean, the, the minocycline was given for one and a half years. All the patches dried up. Now he comes, he, he does it SOS by himself. So this, this is the saga of the, of the father. And this is what we're going to... Uh, uh, see in this patient probably. So this child had a pallor. There was no lymphadenopathy. The ECC scar was excoriated about 5 to 5 centimeters. There was thrusting and some bleeding. Then there was a generalized macular rash. And uh, uh, he pulse rate was slightly high, 120 per minute. His weight was 9.5 kilos at 6.5. So like he was growing not. extremely well. His uh, uh, liver was in last four centimeters below the right costal margin, and his spleen was four centimeters in last. So he had a hepatosplenomegaly with this lesion. Summarized, he was a six month old baby, excised PCS ulceration with generalized rash, pallor, hepatosplenomegaly, a family uh, diagnosis, of, and a family history of tuberculosis, chronic dermatitis. We didn't know this history of uh, this detailed history of the father till recently, but uh, this diagnosis of tuberculosis in the family was there. And therefore, a diagnosis of primary infancy with disseminated TB was considered. His counts were uh, elevated. Uh, platelet counts were slightly high. ESR was always high, 93. Uh, he had a, a normal LFT. The HIV was negative, And his ultrasound abdomen showed hyperspinomegaly. There were multiple tiny micronodules throughout the spinning parenchyma. And there was suspected disseminated TB was 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 one uh, possibility. This X-ray and all X-rays throughout till ten months when we had taken the last X-ray, there was periosteal elevation. There was some lytic lesions in, in the left um, humerus, and uh, because of this generalized uh, uh, bone lesions, we thought it must be osteomyelitis. His uh, lymph immunoglobulin profile was normal. Lymphocyte subset analysis was normal. NBT and BHR were negative, which ruled out chronic granulomatous disease. There was a, because he had this extensive uh, lesions, a whole body MRI had been done, which showed symmetric patchy marrow enhancement in the past. Ephesus, long bones of appendicular skeleton, associated diffuse 
solid periosteal reaction. This periosteal reaction is there right through right from the first time when we saw the child. So a diagnosis of disability, disability disease associated with marrow uh, reconversion or marrow replacement was, was considered. But the, the biopsies of the liver, bone marrow, BCG site, and skin, a skin lesion in the lower limb were done. Biopsies in the liver, bone marrow, and skin lesion showed multiple non caseating granulomatizations, but no AFP was seen on these on the on the on the smear on the bone on the bone marrow uh, or on these uh, lesion on these uh, specimens. Bone marrow was ninety percent uh, cellularity, all three cell lines, and uh, the bone marrow biopsy showed granulomatous inflammation. So we had granulomatous inf inflammation in the liver, in the bone marrow, and on the skin lesion, in, in, in addition to the BC site. Cultures, all culture negative. TB, the uh, uh, gene export was done, was negative on the gastric aspirate, liver tissue, and the skin biopsy initially. The BC scar, of course, was positive for mycobacterium tuberculosis. So, because there was no bacteriological evidence of bacterial um, tuberculosis in the available specimens, and AFP cultures were pending, ATT was not started initially. It was treated as postimilitis with cefirox cefiroxime because it's such extensive bone lesions. Cefiroxime IV was given for three for six weeks. But in view of the strong family history of TB, the diagnosis of MSMB that Dr. Sujit Singh just talked about was strongly considered, and genetic testing was sent. There was some response to treatment. The, Overall, his liver size and spleen size had decreased a little bit, so there may have been some infection. The counts had reduced, his platelet count, his ESR had reduced for a time being to 42. So he was discharged into one week, and I said, on follow, the, at six weeks after we started treatment, the reports came as uh, STAT-1 um, genetic report showed Mendelian susceptibility to mycobacterial disease with autosomal dominant heterozygous STAT-1 gene mutation on the, in the baby. This was the same time that the AFP cultures, there was a late growth of mycobacterium in the liquid and solid cultures. And this was sent to uh, Chennai, the tuberculosis research center in Chennai for uh, identifying the species because it was not mycobacterium tuberculosis young hominis to, to see whether it was, it was um, a bo a mycobacterium bovis or any other typical mycobacterium. The, uh, they couldn't, Identify mycobacterium bovis. They thought it was some other species, but which just could not be characterized. But this child had a BCG with uh, uh, with order to more sites than the, the BCG site and the local lymph node, and we had uh, granulomatizations all over. And there was this mycobacterium uh, which was grown in the lesion and on from the from the leg. Therefore, there was dissemination of this uh, bacilli. Whether it was uh, a typical mycobacteria or, or, or mycobacterium bovis, we're not very certain. Because BCG strain is resistant to pyrazinamide, he was started on four drug regime. The fampicin, isonia acid, ethambutol, and levofloxacin was, was considered because instead of, instead of, uh, of pyrazinamide, and uh, the uh, child improved dramatically uh, after this is the pattern. In the meantime, we did this and uh, grandmother. Uh, uh, genetic testing, the father and the grandmother were also STAT1 positive. So we had a whole family of uh, STAT1 positive. Um, uh, multidisciplinary consideration was done, BMT option was considered. The uh, four drug given for three months, rifampicin, INH, and levofloxacin was totally six months. And then we stopped levofloxacin. He's still on. Uh, rifampicin and INH, which we thought we'd do for two years because we didn't. Paradoxin was, of course, given right through because we didn't know his side was responding so well. He had gained a lot of weight in the rashes and the rashes on skin side of BC side were healing. At 10 and a half months of age, three months after we started the antibiotic treatment, he had a fracture, his left uh, femur uh, with, after a trivial fall. And uh, uh, this uh, and here also the periodontal elevation was seen. So we considered that it may be due to the extensive BCG, uh, disseminated BCG, uh, BCG disease in the bones that there was an area of lytic lesion which could have resulted in the fracture. Disseminated BCG was a diagnosis. Mendelian susceptibility to mycobacterial disease was was uh, confirmed, and you had a family with statin mutation. 
on follow up two years of ATP precious the evidence of duration of therapy before we continue it which finishes in august this year almost two years after treatment is growing by a slight speech delay but he's doing well prognosis is guarded after stopping it we don't know after the, seeing the father's saga in mind we're not sure about the prognosis pmt was most likely not required the family had thrived all three of them had thrived well they very robust very grown very well with no life threatening infections other than the, the tuberculosis that had affected them so this is probably a autosomal dominant disease with variable penetrance in that family and i'd like to just uh, mention about bcg and hiv which uh, is something that uh, you know has changed the protocols for hiv for bcg use in, in, in hiv uh, uh, mothers about uh, children born to mothers with hiv so the result the, of the south african studies the african studies showed that there was more deaths due to disseminated disease and hiv in even in the asymptomatic uh children with hiv uh this uh, uh who had mother mother of uh, mothers with hiv who had children with with uh, proven hiv so the in 2017 there was a change in the protocols and uh, the, the bcg is now been given for uh, mother in the mothers known to have hiv with children with hiv who, who are asymptomatic i will uh, Uh, dwell on this too much because it's it's a it's there is so much to talk about. Stay safe, stay safe, and thank you. I wish I I request Dr. Sujit Singh to tell us something about what he uh, thought about the case. Unmute, sir. So this is a rather unusual patient. and but this is how some of these children would present so they have infections with some kind of mycobacterial infection which is usually not mycobacterium tuberculosis it's a difficult question to answer whether this is bcg which has got disseminated there is strong circumstantial evidence that yes indeed this was bcg but to prove that this is bcg you have to culture and we have faced the same difficulty as what you have faced and in majority of our patients we are unmute 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 you've got mute again yeah yeah so we have been unable to prove uh, bcg uh, on culture in our laboratory for reasons that are not clear we have tried working out with our microbiologist but i don't recall even a single patient where there was a clear cut evidence that yes on culture it was uh, mycobacterium bovis normally yes they confirm that this is some kind of mycobacterial infection but they are unable to be uh, 100% sure that this is bovis we have tried pcrs and at in our microbiology department they have their own in house multiplex pcrs with several insertion sequences but even after doing these multiplex pcrs uh, uh, it's not very clear whether this is uh, mycobacterium bovis or it could be some of the other um, uh, atypical mycobacteria uh, which have resulted in this infection we have seen patients of msmd presenting with distant uh, bony metastasis and that is how the first patient with dr sheel and i uh, uh, sheel and our center we worked together uh, that is how that child had presented in fact i think this girl now must be in her early 20s uh, she must be on dr sheela's follow up so she also had uh, uh, lytic bone lesion uh, all over and such lesions MSMD is not one disease, as Dr. Sagar, I'm sure, will um, you know dwell on it. It can be caused by several uh, mutations, several defects, and that is the challenge of uh, MSMD because um, the initial flow cytometry may not give you the diagnosis, and quite often you have to do detailed genetic studies uh, to to come at the diagnosis. The other challenge. that you face in these patients is how do you treat these uh, children 
So Sagar again will discuss the treatment options that are available. And uh, some of these patients can have uh, salmonella infection. So we have had patients with salmonella osteomyelitis unusual salmonella infections. That is another presentation of MSMD. So I'm sure Dr. Sagar, Dr. Amit, Dr. Sheila, uh, they would have a uh, lot to contribute uh, to this patient. Oh, thank thank you. you, sir. Thank you. I'll request Dr. Anil uh, from Anil Kumar, the, uh, from the Institute of, Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences in Edipoli. He's a microbiologist. Uh, can you share your slide, uh, uh, Anil? Anil? So, Dr. Anil Kumar is a professor in HOD of Microbiology at Amrit Institute of Medical Sciences. He's a, a, a clinical microbiologist for the last 40 years, a teacher. We've always got, got hold of him. We have any problems in microbiology for his uh, inputs. He's his research interest is characterized as antimicrobial resistance, outbreak investigation, and he's a great speaker. I invite you, Dr. Anil, to talk on the microbiology of BCG. Dr. Anil? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. sure. Microbiologists have not of much of help for identifying BCG. It's very true because it's a very difficult pathogen to grow as well as to identify. So I'll dwell something on microbiology of the BCG, how it came. So it was a 100-year-old vaccine. And it's really amazing that we still keep on discussing that vaccine. And it's still relevant in the sense that some people believe that corona can also be cured by BCG. And this bacteria was first in... A, Introduced as a vaccine in 1921 by Calmet and Gurin. They subcultured the Mycobacterium bovis, which is a pathogenic bacteria to the cattle. And then they came up with an attenuated strain called as BCG. 13 years of subculture, 230 serial subcultures. And we have to understand that this Mycobacterium bovis BCG is part of the Mycobacterium tuberculosis complex. And the complex contains Mycobacterium tuberculosis, Africanum bovis, Microti, and Canity. And whatever diagnosis you get in your lab is mycobacterium tuberculosis complex. Nobody tells you whether it's tuberculosis, bovis, or BCG. So by default, we assume that all mycobacterium tuberculosis complex that we identify is tuberculosis and we treat thereof. Now, this particular seed strain from the Pasteur Institute was given to different countries. And there are 13 different strains as of now, which are being used all over the world. And they are named according to the city. So Pasteur, Danish are considered to be the very good strains, the very immunogenic strains, where Glaxo and Tokyo strains are considered to be a bit weaker when compared to Danish and Pasteur strains. And one thing you should understand that whenever you treat bovis or BCG, we should understand it's a inherently resistant to pyrazinamide. Pyrazinamide doesn't have any role for treatment. And the vaccine that we give contains most often the dead bacteria, only 5% may be alive. And that is what causes the BCG reaction when you give the vaccination. And it differs with the strain. If you give a Tokyo strain, 25% of them will be viable in the vaccine. So identification of BCG is very difficult. Let me be frank, nobody will tell you that it's BCG in any lab because routine diagnosis does not take care of BCG. If you do a CBNAT or any PCR thereof, which targets the RPOB or IS6110, that is the most commonly used genes all over India or all over the world also, so it picks up only mycobacterium tuberculosis complex. That's what we are bothered about. And no lab uh, would go beyond mycobacterium tuberculosis complex. So members of mycobacterium tuberculosis complex have got a common phenomena that they uh, secrete a particular protein called as MPT64. And this is a very good test where you can pick up the MPT64 from the culture isolates and determine whether it's a tuberculous bacilli or a non-tuberculous bacilli. It's a simple card test that every lab does which tests the culture. As Sudhir sir has already said, it's difficult to culture, but if you happen to culture this bacilli, you can just do a card test to know whether it's a mycobacterium tuberculosis complex by putting in the card. In 10 minutes, you come to know whether the protein is being secreted or not, and whether it's a mycobacterium tuberculosis complex or not. And BCG belongs to the mycobacterium tuberculosis complex. Now, the problem with BCG is that after repeated subcultures for these many years, it has lost its property, normal property. So out of 13 strains that are existing now, only five of them can produce MPT64. 
so can be identified as mycobacterium tuberculosis complex and eight of them have lost their ability to produce micro this mpt64 protein so bcg russia as i put it in bold and bcg danish are the two bcg strains that are very important for our setup bcg russia produces mpt64 danish strain doesn't produce mpt uh, doesn't produce mpt64 and all bcg strains have lost their uh, the production of esat6 and cfp10 antigen so that is the antigen that we use for the interferon gamma assay and we claim that it doesn't cross react with bcg so how do we diagnose it so if you see a case of bcg osis or bcg associated infection you send the tissue or a pus and what we do is we do a smear afb and most unlikely it could come positive but if you're fortunate it can come positive for smear afb if you do a histopathology you'll see a granuloma or a caseation gene expert as sir has already done in his uh, in his case and it came positive now gene expert positive doesn't mean mycobacterium tuberculosis it also means that it is mycobacterium tuberculosis complex so it could be any of the four or five organisms and most often it's mycobacterium tuberculosis unless until you have an evidence of bcg infection or some underlying disorder then if you culture it it's difficult to culture but if you culture it, happen to culture it, it the smear can come positive if the smear will come positive and you can appreciate the coding that is the bacilli will clump together so this is specifically seen in mycobacterium tuberculosis complex so there you have a broad idea that it's a, a member of mycobacterium tuberculosis complex then as i have already told you half the bcg strains do not secrete the mpt64 protein itself so if you do a cart test to identify whether it's a mycobacterium tuberculosis complex or ntm half of them will be negative and you will not get it sequencing sequencing the normal genes like rpob and is6110 doesn't tell you whether it's bcg or mycobacterium tuberculosis because very identical so sequencing you will have to target multiple genes and you have to do an extra amount of work molecular characterization that involves a lot of money and effort so what are the implications of using a mycobacterium B bcg strain which is mpt64 negative imagine you have a case of bcg infection and the strain is mpt cards mpt64 negative so what happens that if i culture it the cart test will come negative the cart test is negative i interpret it as a non tuberculous mycobacteria now it's a big confusion for the clinician they think it is bcg infection i isolate a bacteria which i stand by my report saying that it is non tuberculous mycobacteria because it doesn't secrete the mpt64 protein unless and until i know that there are some strains of bcg that don't secrete it so therapeutic implications are Im immense if you go by the microbiologist that non tuberculous mycobacteria you treat with alternative uh, drugs that are not att because it won't work in most of the non tuberculous mycobacteria so therapeutic implications are immense if you don't realize that it's a bcg so what happens if you have a strain which is mpt64 positive if i happen to culture it i will do a cart test cart test is positive i identified mycobacterium tuberculosis complex therapeutic implications again it's better to identify mtb complex rather than non tuberculous mycobacteria because you at least you give att if it's a disseminated infection but paracetamide is not required but one more thing is that if you don't realize it's mycobacterium uh, bovis bcg then the associated implications that uh, that whether the patient has got an underlying immunosuppression you will never think about it you'll think it's normal tuberculosis you won't look into the underlying immunosuppression or the familial history or anything you won't investigate and you will miss the diagnosis altogether so that comes to the question which bcg strain is used in india that's a big question india is very very unique we use two different strains and one which produces mpt64 and one which doesn't produce mpt64 if you go to the private setup if they give buy you the vaccine the vaccine is from serum institute of india it uses russian strain which is mpt64 positive if you go by the government vaccine if you take the free vaccine all of them contain the danish strain which is more potent and is mpt64 negative so there's a huge confusion here that if the patient gets a private vaccine it is positive and if you culture it you will get it as mtb complex if you take the government vaccine which is mpt64 negative it will be identified as non tuberculous mycobacteria if you happen to grow it so what is missing so clearly the lab will not be helpful in identifying it properly unless and until you give a proper history a detailed history you have to give you have to tell the microbiologist that it's a bcg vaccination complication it looks like disseminated bcg infection so have a look at it or you tell him that there is some underlying condition immunosuppression he has reacted very badly to the bcg vaccine always order a smear afb a gene expert and a culture together don't miss any of them if you have all the three together then there is a chance that we can identify it's a mycobacterium tuberculosis complex 
probably it could be a bcg infection there are pcrs a multiplex pcr for rd1 and rd9 region if possible we can uh, we have this pcr here we do a multiplex pcr here if you do this multiplex pcr if rd1 and rd9 both are positive it is mycobacterium tuberculosis rd1 alone is positive it is bovis if both are negative it is mycobacterium bovis bcg it's clear cut you can identify whether bcg or not provided you i grow the bacteria and you identified it's a mycobacterium tuberculosis complex then you go ahead with this particular pcr to differentiate whether it's actually bcg or not so this is our own case where we had two patients two children who had bcg infection one had a cervical lymph nodopathy and one had a abscess in the knee one year old guy so we isolated the bacteria the gene expert from the tissue were positive and once we isolated the bacteria we did the mpd car 64 card test it came negative so we were baffled the gene expert says is mycobacterium tuberculosis and the card test says it's non tuberculosis mycobacteria so when we went further we did as part of a research and we amplified the gyrase b gene we did an rflp cut into pieces we did the sequencing we found the specific mutation that is seen in case of bcg here and then we sequenced and identified that it's a danish strain we isolated the we grew the vaccine strain we bought the vaccine grew the vaccine and compared it with the isolates that we got and ultimately we found out that the patients were having bcg infection the bcg strain was danish strain and that was given by the government vaccine uh, which was free of cost so that's how we identified it so take home message is that lab diagnosis is fraught with errors as sir has already said it's very difficult for a lab to give whether it's bcg or not you have to give additional information you have to ask for additional testing then only it's possible to identify whether it's bcg or not the most important thing is clinical correlation and you ask the microbiologist to have a morphological characteristic also to look into the morphology the coding features if it's mpt64 negative you see for coding if coding is there then it's still a uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis complex you can send it to higher centers you can send it to us we can identify whether it's mycobacterium bcg or not thank you that was excellent dr anil kumar thank you so much for presentation i think you have cleared a lot of doubts about you know whether we are doing the wrong thing when we sending the sample and not getting the results dr surjit uh, can you uh, give your comments on this uh, uh, presentation dr surjit singh unmute 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 uh i think we can discuss it later after we yeah, have the sure. case discussion yeah nothing much to add now yeah. so next we'll have dr sagar sir can you share your slides um anil please uh, yeah sir, please share your slides slides uh so is my screen visible sir yeah yeah sure so dr sagar will be talking about split bcg and uh, uh he is the first uh, dm in pediatric immunodeficiency and rheumatology at from pj chandigarh he is dr sujit singh's uh, first student dm student in this area and uh, uh his prodigy he, uh, that's why we have uh, dr sujit singh to to uh, help him out in, in whatever you know he has a problem he actually gets to dr sujit singh for for opinion so he is working at the uh he's a consultant pediatric immunologist and rheumatologist at the CMI Bangalore he visits the uh Astor hospital hospital in Cochin uh, once a month and so we have the pleasure of having him to contribute to a very lot of cases that we have in uh, to pick up immunodeficiency which we were not initially uh doing until he primed us for this particular uh issue he's a director of FPID center of excellence for diagnosis and treatment of primary immunodeficiency disorders and he is a treasurer of the ISPID Indian Society of Pediatric Immunodeficiency he is an expert in various areas in immunodeficiency and is a is a quality is a vocalist he goes around spreading the message of immunodeficiency wherever he goes and that's that's of the sagar for you please start of the sagar uh thank thanks a lot sir for that wonderful introduction thanks a lot uh it's in fact a pleasure to be a part of this discussion especially with dr isununi around and with uh, professor sujit singh sir uh, guiding us through 
so the topic that has been assigned to me is disseminated bcg infection and immune deficiency uh it is quite clear as of now that bcg being a attenuated live vaccine uh, you may get a localized adenitis but the moment it gets disseminated to distant sites we know that uh, this particular child or adult has is not handled this live vaccine appropriately and is likely having some defect in the immune system so as a rule of thumb the moment you see disseminated bcg infection one must investigate for immune deficiency the next question would be what are those immune deficiencies where uh, one must look for when you see a child or an adult with a disseminated bcg infection now coming to certain basics so we all know that when we talk about immunity or immune system we talk about innate and adaptive immune systems in the adaptive immune system we have the cell mediated immunity numeral immunity mediated by b cells which produce antibodies one must always wonder why there are two different arms of the immune system and to make it simple intracellular pathogens are handled by the by the b cells that is the humoral immune system and why do i talk so because mycobacteria is an intracellular pathogen and if you have if you have a defect in the cell mediated immunity you are likely to get a infection with an intracellular pathogen whereas if you have infections only with extracellular pathogens it could be a b cell mediated immune defect so it is quite clear that if you come across the child with mycobacterium infection i think somebody has to mute mr yes manar manus please mute others to highlight <clears throat> am i audible yes yes you are yes you are yes you are yeah so i think the most important thing i want to highlight from this slide is that mycobacteria is an intracellular pathogen and in patients who have b cell disorders or isolated b cell defects and hypogamma globulinemia they would they would not be at increased risk of having mycobacterial infection now uh, i want to make it basically simple to understand why we have immune deficiencies that can cause mycobacterial infection so the moment a mycobacteria enters our body <clears throat> maybe through lungs or through the vaccination uh, the first one of the first responses would be the macrophages that will engulf the mycobacteria and we know that these macrophages present this mycobacteria say in the lymph node to the t cells and then the t cells are activated they would help clearing this mycobacterial infection so the macrophage would probably be the first line of defense now take this example in this slide you can see this macrophage is infected with this mycobacteria and the moment this macrophage is infected it starts secreting cytokines like il12 and this interleukin 12 then acts on the interleukin 12 receptor which is present on the t cell and now the t cell is activated so first signal that the mycobacteria presents the peptide to the t cell and another signal is through the cytokine interleukin 12 and this interleukin 12 receptor is present on t cell the t cell is activated and now the t cell starts producing interferon gamma this interferon gamma acts on the interferon gamma receptor here on the macrophage the macrophage gets activated some enzymes within the macrophage get activated and there is killing of the mycobacteria so this is a normal physiological thing that would happen in a healthy immune system and the mycobacteria would be killed it is also important to understand that the activated t cell will express the cd40 ligand which will interact with cd40 which is present on the macrophage and this interaction is also very, very crucial for killing of the mycobacteria within the macrophage i think this particular slide is very important to understand the entire pathophysiology of uh, immune deficiencies behind mycobacterial infections now it is quite natural that if any of these arm is missing you would be predisposed to persistent mycobacterial infection 
so failure to kill mycobacteria could be due to the following reasons number 1 absent t cells we know that these t cells would be sending the signal to the macrophages to kill the mycobacteria if t cells are completely absent these patients cannot handle mycobacteria an example for that is severe combined immune deficiency i would present a case to highlight this and we also know that cd4 lymphopenia which is the most one of the most important t cell subset is cd4 subset and if you have cd4 lymphopenia again you get mycobacterial infection example being hiv now there could be a defect in the intracellular killing within the macrophages and i said that for intracellular killing you need certain enzymes an enzyme like nadph oxidase is needed and if that is absent you get chronic granulomatous disease and again those patients can have increased risk of mycobacterial infection or disseminated bcg as i highlighted the il12 il12 receptor and the interferon gamma and its receptor pathway if there is any defect in this pathway example the il12 receptor is missing or the ifn gamma receptor is missing this pathway is incomplete and that is how the macrophage will not get activated and these patients will get mycobacterial infections or the disseminated bcg and this group of disorders are called msmd the mendelian susceptibility to mycobacterial disease we are going to have a detailed discussion in the next talk about msmd now i i told you that cd40 40 ligand in, interaction is very important and if you have a defect here say in the cd40 ligand this disease is called hyper igm syndrome because these patients can produce only igm they cannot produce other immunoglobulins and even in these patients wherein you have cd40 ligand defect the macrophage cannot get activated and there would be increased risk of bcg and mycobacterial infections but then let me also state that there are several categories of hyper igm syndrome not all have increased risk of mycobacterial infections so whenever you see a child with disseminated atypical mycobacteria these could be the possibilities hiv severe combined immune deficiency chronic granulomatous disease mendelian susceptibility to mycobacterial disease and at least one of the types of hyper igm syndrome which is caused by cd40 ligand defect let me quickly take you to uh, through two quick examples this is a 7 old girl child from bangalore she presented to us with oral thrush she had enlarged lymph nodes and hepatosplenomegaly and the biopsy showed that this is likely disseminated bcg and you can see this is an disseminated bcg oral thrush failure to thrive and the x ray showed thymus and then we proceeded further the hemogram showed neutrophilic leukocytosis but what was striking is the lymphocyte count l was only 8% absolute lymphocyte count was 1200 and we all know that lymphocyte uh, the lymphocyte uh, normally in infants you have lymphocytic predominance and whenever you see lymphopenia in an infant it is it directly points to a severe combined immunity a disease wherein t cells are absent so we got the cd3 count which is the t cell marker and t cells were only 2% confirming this patient had severe combined immune deficiency and presented with disseminated bcg because of absence of t cells this is the second case a 9 month old girl who again with disseminated bcg this time cb showed marked neutrophilia the counts were as high as 20 to 25000 like predominance the lymphocyte count was normal so we knew this probably is not severe combined immune deficiency we worked up the child for nitro blue tetrazolium dye reduction test was done which was abnormal and which confirmed that this patient had chronic granulomatous disease another test by name dhr can be done which also was confir uh, confirmative of the same diagnosis this is a disease wherein neutrophils are present in the body but the intracellular killing is at defect because of uh, a deficiency of an enzyme named nadph oxidase the message i would like to give disseminated bcg one must always work up for immune deficiency bcg vaccination should be postponed with a family history of primary immune deficiency until the definite condition has been ruled out my last slide whenever you see a disseminated child with disseminated bcg please rule out hiv if it is an infant look at the lymphocyte counts if there is lymphopenia this is likely severe combined immune deficiency if not look at the nbt and dhr if they are abnormal this is chronic granulomatous disease 
you easily get a image profile if the igg iga are very low and only igm is elevated this is going to be hyper igm syndrome and if these preliminary tests do not pick up any condition as mentioned before you can proceed with a genetic testing and that would likely pick up msmd mendelian susceptibility which is going to be discussed in detail in the next talk thank you thank you dr sagar uh, excellent presentation as usual uh, i think uh, we'll go on to the next presentation by dr amit amit are you on yeah yeah i'm on yeah So Amit, Dr. Amit Rawat uh, is going to present for you MSMD. Uh, can you share your slides, please? Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. I hope all of you are uh, uh, getting tuned to this whole uh, um, disorder. I mean, it's becoming more and more people are becoming more and more aware of it. As Dr. Sudhir Singh has uh, told you, that we must keep our minds open to this diagnosis when you see this uh, i think dr sony had a tough time 12 20 years of uh, dealing with that father of this patient uh amit are you having problems yeah no no i i'm, I'm no. done okay so dr amit Ra rawat is the professor of pediatric allergy and immunology at the department of pediatrics of pgi chandigarh he is a pathologist but uh, his special interest has been in uh, Uh, genetic defects and antibody deficiencies. And that's how he's he's here. Complement defects, monogenic forms of uh, early onset SLE have all been his uh, uh, bread and butter. And uh, he's had 120 publications in peer-reviewed journals. Next slide, please. And thank he's you. Going uh, talk, he's going to talk thank you, uh, Dr. Jason and uh, the IAP Kerala for giving me this opportunity to discuss about the pathophysiology of Mendelian susceptibility to mycobacterial diseases. So what I will be doing is I will be uh, taking two case scenario to illustrate the pathophysiology and the diagnostic workup for uh, these diseases. So the first case is a 17-month-old boy who was immunized for age. At six months, uh, he presented with left, left axillary lymphadenitis. Uh, X's in biopsy was done, which revealed a uh, acid fast uh, bacilli, which was reported as BCG adenitis. Uh, he was treated with ATT uh, with uh, poor response at Uh, from five, uh, from nine months to fifteen months, he had a swelling over the right parietal bone and also the right uh, part of uh, the the right upper end of humerus. And the uh, aspirated material uh, yielded uh, the aspiration yielded pur purulent uh, material. And on general uh, physical examination, he had hepatosplenomegaly. So these are the X-rays from the child. As you can see, that this child also had those osteolytic lesions that you saw in the previous case. This is the right parietal bone where you see this osteolytic lesion. This is the upper end of right humerus where you see another lytic lesion, and then there were similar lytic lesions in the upper end of uh, the left uh, fem femur, and this is the again the right parietal bone showing these lytic lesions. So the hemogram showed my anemia. There was uh, the platelet count was normal. Uh, the, 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 an FNAC was done from the scalp swelling, which revealed epithelial granulomas with acid fast bacilli. And the lymph node biopsy was also done, which revealed ill formed epithelial granulomas with AFP. Uh, HIV serology was done, which was non reactive. Immunoglobulins were all elevated, uh, including the G, A, M, and E. And to rule out uh, uh, CGD, uh, Uh, an NBT and DHR was performed, which showed the normal uh, expression, uh, normal reduction on NBT and a normal shift on DHR. The lymphocyte subsets were uh, normal for age. There was no uh, defect in the, there's no uh, T, T cell lymphopenia indicating skid. So, this case is a case of a disseminated tuberculosis with multifocal osteomyelitis and also uh, the, uh, the There's a probable etiology of uh, Mycobacterium bovis, probably BCG related, and HIV, SCID, and CGD have been ruled out in this case. So the clinical diagnosis in this case was Mendelian susceptibility to mycobacterial disease. And with this uh, diagnosis in mind, and with multifocal osteomyelitis, uh, IFN gamma expression was seen on the neutrophils, as you can see from the dot plots here. This is the 
a neutrophil which has been gated on flow cytometry. And then uh, we look for the expression of CD119, which is, which is the FN gamma R1 receptor. And as you can see in the patient, the expression is more. So in the partial dominant form of uh, FN gamma R1, increased expression of this FN gamma R1 on the neutrophils and the monocytes. So uh, a genetic uh, workup was also done in this case and uh, a heterozygous variant was formed in the IFN gamma R1 gene. So this is a four nucleotide deletion from C818 uh, to 821, uh, which results in a frame shift mutation. And this is the diagnosis was then confirmed, confirmed to be a partial dominant form of IFN gamma R1 defect. The second case is an eight month old girl who presented with abdominal distension, fever, she had a non-healing uh, uh, left axillary ulcer for one week. Uh, this is the history of the presenting illness. She started uh, the, the, she was symptomatic since six weeks of age. She had non-healing ulcer at the site of BCG vaccination, which was persistent. Uh, she had multiple swellings in the left, left axilla. Uh, similar swellings were present in the right axilla, the bilateral inguinal region, the neck. And she also had... Uh, fever, which is moderate to high grade, and she had abdominal distension and fever for three weeks. And with these complaints, she was admitted at, at PGA. In the family history, there's a uh, history of third degree consanguinity. There were four siblings. One of the siblings, uh, elder siblings, had died at three months of age. The details were not available, and this is our index case. Uh, term, uh, normal vaginal delivery, uh, you no know, smooth uh, perinatal transition. Immunization history was complete for age. And as you can see here, uh, at the site of the BCG uh, uh, vaccination, there is a suppurative adenitis with a non-healing ulcer. So on the database, again, we have an eight-month-old girl who had a non-healing uh, uh, BCG site uh, uh, ulcer with discharge, a non-healing left axillary ulcer, moderate to uh, high-grade fever, moderate to low-grade fever, and then uh, generalized significant lymphadenopathy, which was involving both the axillary lymph nodes and the inguinal lymph nodes. So the possibility again in this case was disseminated bestigiosis uh, and uh, immunodeficiencies were thought of uh, severe combined immunodeficiency, CGD, hyper IgM, uh, all the disorders which Sagar has highlighted in his uh, previous presentation, these were considered. Uh, CT abdomen was done, which revealed hepatosplenomegaly with focal hepatic and splenic lesions, uh, periportal soft tissue and uh, vascular changes, and then there was uh, there was uh, abdominal, inguinal, and uh, lymph nodes in the left lateral thoracic region. This was the FNA from the left and the right cervical region, which showed uh, foamy macrophages and was teeming with this acid fast bacilli. So, with a diagnosis of uh, Turulog skid, uh, lymphocyte subset analysis was done. The T, B, and the NK cells were normal, suggesting that this is possibly not a case of severe combined immunodeficiency. A DHR was performed to rule out uh, chronic granulomatous disease, and it turned out also to be normal. There was a normal shift. Uh, the upper panel shows the control and the lower panel the patient. And as you can see, this is normal. However, when we did the IFN uh, IL-12, we set the beta-1 expression on the neutrophils in the patient, on the PBMCs, we see that this is markedly decreased in the patient compared to the control. So this is a case of uh, disseminated BCGosis. There is a reduced IL-12 uh, receptor beta-1 expression on the PBMCs. And when we did the, uh, we are currently doing the targeted NGS for uh, our patients with PID and IL-12 receptor beta-1 gene is present in that panel. And when we run this patient sample on that uh, NGS panel, we found a, a homozygous splice site variant. Uh, in the IL-12 receptor beta-1 gene, confirming the diagnosis to be Mendelian susceptibility to mycobacterial disease with IL-12 receptor beta-1 deficiency. Uh, a modified ATT was started. Uh, however, uh, the current status is that this child had uh, significant of other problems and she succumbed to her illness. So coming on to the pathophysiology of MSMD. So whenever mac uh, macrophages and dendritic cells, which are the antigen-presenting cells, they engulf any intracellular pathogen, be it uh, M tuberculosis or any other intracellular bacteria or pathogen. Uh, they, there is an increased secretion of IL-12. This IL-12 then acts on the T lymphocytes and the NK cells via the IL-12 receptors. It has got IL-12 receptor beta-1 unit, as we saw in the previous case, but there's also an IL-12 receptor beta-2 unit as well. And then this leads to 
uh, signal transduction in the T lymphocytes and production of interferon ga gamma. And this interferon gamma then acts on the interferon gamma receptor, which is present on the macrophage and the dendritic cells. This interferon gamma, interferon gamma receptor also has got two subunits, the interferon gamma R1 and the interferon gamma R2. And downstream of this interferon gamma, you have got the JAK stat signaling pathway. So you have got downstream of this JAK and then the stat, the stat dimer, the stat dimerization occurs, and then there is uh, the transcription of genes which are involved in the production of IL-12 and other cytokines. So in uh, MSMD, there is a defect in this intracellular killing, and the, the predominant axis which is involved is the IFN gamma IL-12. Although now we know that the IL-23 also works to the same cycle, so it is the IFN gamma IL-12 IL-23 cycle axis which is impaired in these group of disorders. So this is a, 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 a pie chart from a large series of uh, patients from all over the world. This was over 400 patients which were recruited in this study. And as you can see, the most common defect is the IL-12 receptor beta-1 defect it comprises of almost half the cases of MSMD. The next most common, which comprises around 20% of the cases is the IFN gamma R1 partial dominant form. And then we have got other forms, uh, less common forms like IL-12 beta, which is another 12%. And then uh, the IL, uh, the STAT1, which results in MSMT is the partial dominant form. It, it, is, it accounts for just 4% of the total case load. And then you have got other genes. So even within the same gene, you've got different defects like IFN gamma R1 can be a complete defect, uh, complete recessive, it can be partial recessive. It can be partial dominant. Similarly, in IL, IFN gamma R2, it can be complete recessive, partial recessive, partial dominant. And in the STAT1, one, the one which pre presents with MSMD is, uh, has a partial dominant phenotype. And then you've got IRF2, ISD50, NEMO, et cetera. But the most common ones are the ones which involve the IL-12 and the IFN gamma axis. The IL-12 beta one is the most common. And then we have got the second most common is the partial dominant IFN gamma R1. Uh, this, uh, this was from the same study where we looked at the infections in these patients with MSMD. This, this again is the data from more than 400 patients. And in the patients with the IFN gamma R uh, uh, receptor, both R1 and R2, and the STAT1 deficiency, you can see the uh, environmental mycobacteria, the non tuberculous mycobacteria, they were the most common pathogens which were cultured. And ECG was the next common. But then uh, MSMD is a kind of a misnomer because Although it is known as Mendelian susceptibility to mycobacterial disease, there are other uh, pathogens which can affect these individuals. Uh, most important among them is uh, Salmonella, but you can also have Histoplasma uh, capsulatum, Tocidiasis, uh, uh, Enterococcus, uh, even new, Pneumocystis, Cryptosporidium, toxos, uh, Toxoplasma. These have all been reported in patients with MSMD. So this was for the IFN gamma uh, uh, receptor defect and the STAT1 defects. And then similarly, looking at the infections in the IL-12 receptor beta-1 and IL, uh, IL, I'm sorry, this is IL-12 P40. This is the P40 subunit of the interleukin-12. So in this, the, uh, the BCG was more common than the environmental or the non-tuberculous mycobacteria. And Salmonella is also one common infection which is seen in this IL-12 receptor beta-1 uh, defects. The Salmonella is usually a non-typhoidal Salmonella commonly salmonella enteritis, but uh, the usual salmonella typhi can also affect these individuals. We had one case where uh, the child had recurrent salmonella typhi infections and he was having a IL-12 receptor beta-1 deficiency. So uh, although the, uh, the uh, non-tubercular mycobacteria, the environmental mycobacteria and BCG are the most common pathogens, but salmonella and other pathogens can also be uh, also affect these individuals. And uh, in a, I'm reminded of a series from Hong Kong where they had re reported Penicillium marfanae, which is another uh, infection which is uh, not which is very uncommon outside of HIV patients. And they reported this in patients with this defects of IFN gamma uh, IL-12 axis. So what we can do in the laboratory for testing these individuals, you can uh, look at the circulating IFN gamma levels in the plasma of the serum. This will be very high in patients with a complete defects where there's a complete IFN gamma R1 or R2 defect, you will have very high levels of IFN gamma. This is a very simple assay which can be done by ELISA. You can do a cytokine release assay. This requires culture. So you should have a culture facility to do, do these assays. You can do this in PPMC or whole blood. Uh, 
you separate PBMC or you incubate whole blood with BCG, and then you stimulate with IL, either IF and gamma, recombinant IF and gamma, or recombinant IL2, and then look for the production of IF and gamma and ILP70. Then uh, there are a lot of flow cytometry based assays which you can do. You can detect the extracellular receptors like IF and gamma receptor 1, receptor 2, IL2 receptor beta 1, beta 2. And then uh, you can also do some functional studies to look at the uh, uh, the downstream effects of the defects in these receptors. You can look for post uh, phosphorylated STAT1, NIF and gamma R1 and R2 defects, and P STAT and uh, phosphorylated STAT4 uh, in IL-12 receptor uh, beta1 and beta2 defects. Uh, these flow cytometry based assays and the cytokine release assays are not readily available everywhere. So most of the uh, people who are practicing outside, they would have to resort to gene sequencing to know the genetic defect. So this is the algorithm which I found uh, from Lancet Inf Infectious Disease by Stephen Holland, who's an authority in chronic granulomatous disease and MSMD. And what they've suggested in this algorithm is that if a patient presents with a disseminated non-tuberculous mycobacterial infection, and if there is, there's a clear-cut history of uh, X-linked transmission, then you can suspect either a, a, a defect of uh, X-linked CGD, uh, X-linked CGD, when it affects only the monocyte mon uh, lineage, then it can lead to MSMD. Or the more common would be a NEMO, uh, the NEMO which is caused by a defect in the IKBKG gene. So this would be when this maternity derived, if it is adult onset, it is more likely to be a autoantibody mediated defect. And then you can do a CBC. If you have a reduced uh, B cells, monocytes and NK cells, it could be a GATA2 defect. If you have uh, absent dendritic cells, it could be a IRF8. And then you can do for uh, do a IF and gamma R1, R2 staining by flow cytometry. If this is decreased, then probably it is a defect of IF, IF and gamma R1, R2. And then you can sequence these genes. Or you can do the what I suggested, the, the cytokine release assays. You can stimulate the PBS, PBMC with mitogens or with IF and gamma and then measure different cytokines. You can measure IL-12 or you can measure uh, IF and gamma by stimula after stimulating with IL-12. And then, depending on those results, you can then sequence the corresponding genes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amit, for that excellent presentation. I, I hope it's not gone over everybody's head, but uh, uh, I'd like Dr. Sujit Singh to give us an idea of... Uh, Anil, Anil, please... Uh, uh, your your slide sharing is going on, please. Yeah, Nil should I cut it? Yeah, cut it, please. Yeah. So this may look a little overwhelming, but as clinicians, um, you know, we have to be very careful when dealing with these patients. Uh, whenever you see a patient with tuberculosis, which is either unusual or recurrent, or you have an unusual mycobacterial um, species, one should resist the temptation to keep on treating these patients with antitubercular therapies of various kinds. That is the time when we need to think about an underlying primary immune deficiency. And the good part is that there are a few centers available in our country now where most, yeah, of, these, where most of these tests can be done. We really don't have to send the samples overseas, as was the case, say, around 10 to 15 years ago. So once you think of an underlying PID, it is not very difficult to come to uh, a reasonable diagnosis. And with a fair bit of flow cytometry, some genetic tests, you can hit the molecular diagnosis these days uh, with some effort. This is definitely not a bedside diagnosis. At the bedside or in the clinic, what you can uh, suggest is that, yes, there is a high chance of an underlying PID. And then getting these tests done does take a few weeks, sometimes a few months, to come to a diagnosis. Uh, as far as recurrent salmonella infections are concerned, our first exposure to this uh, group uh, happened, I think, almost 15 years ago. This was an Air Force officer who had had recurrent salmonella osteomyelitis. And as a result of these uh, recurrent infections, in fact, he was about to be boarded out uh, from the 
uh, armed forces. So that was our first exposure of a recurrent salmonella in a patient with MSND. And since that time, we have had a few more cases where salmonella is the culprit. But uh, 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 as clinicians, it is, you know, uh, I think uh, it is upon us to think of these infections and not rush with various um, combinations of antimicrobacterial drugs or whenever there is a patient who has, have, who has received several courses of ATT, I think that is a situation where we must think of an underlying MSMD. Thank you. Dr. G said, please unmute. Please unmute. Suparna Guha, as uh, Dr. Sujit, uh, I think, can answer this. Dr. S Dr. Suparna Guha has asked that for all children with uh, repeated uh, uh, STIFE infections, do we check for MS MSMD? If, if it is. A, how often yeah. do they have a relapse? If it is a culture proven salmonella, and especially if it's an unusual salmonella infection, for instance, Salmonella osteomyelitis, Salmonella abscesses. Yes, then one should suspect MSMD. But if it is just a, a difficult uh, Salmonella, which is difficult to eradicate, one would just follow up. But Salmonella osteomyelitis, recurrent Salmonella osteomyelitis, recurrent abscesses because of Salmonella. Yes, one would uh, think of MSMD. So then the question that what are therefore the conditions where you would suspect MSMD? We have heard a lot, lot of uh, uh, issues that have been discussed by Dr. Sagar and Dr. Amit. But what are the definitive conditions which you will think of MSMD? The child yes. in, uh, in, in clinics. So different uh, forms of tuberculosis, unusual forms of tuberculosis. When you cannot identify the species, unusual mycobacterial species, unusual clinical forms of tuberculosis, tuberculosis that is difficult to eradicate, recurrent tuberculosis. It is these situations or BCG, complication, unusual complications related to BCG. So in our experience, these are the situations where the yield for MSMD will be the highest. We have had a few patients with unusual salmonella infection and the other infections which Dr. Amit highlighted maybe an odd case we may have seen, but tuberculosis and salmonella, these are the uh, organisms where we've had the maximum yield. Another question is, what is the prognosis for an MSMD, depending on the, what is it? Uh, this is a very tricky question because uh, it depends on the phenotype. Some of these MSMD uh, phenotypes are uh, not all, um, I mean, they are um, uh, not that severe. So you treat the uh, tuberculosis, you will give a prolonged course of ATT, maybe uh, 24 months of ATT, they remain well. As was the case of uh, uh, our first patient, uh, Dr. Sheila's case. And I think she gave just one course of ATT and this child has remained well. But we have had other patients where as soon as you stop ATT, you get into difficulty. Sagar has uh, reviewed this aspect of tuberculosis. So may I request Sagar to, to dwell on this? Sagar? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so basically, uh, as sir highlighted, I am sure this is a single disease. Uh, but to just make it simple that some of them, as Dr. Amit uh, Rawat was highlighting, that uh, uh, those are complete defects. For example, the IFN gamma receptor complete he was talking about this is a severe form of immune deficiency. And those are a small subgroup of patients where there is a clear indication for bone marrow transplant. Patients essentially would have severe BCG and other complications and essentially would die within first years. So the type of MSM definitely decides the prognosis. 
Number two, the other common forms of MSMD, which we were talking about, like the interleukin-12 receptor beta-1 deficiency, and our patient, which has got this autosomal dominant deficiency, their prognosis is reasonable. However, they don't have essentially completely a healthy life. They are at risk of recurrent infection, may need prolonged courses of anti-tubercular therapy and antibiotics, and where facilities are available, people also treat them with interferon. Gamma therapy. But in such patients, it is essentially seen that they go on to live into adulthood and uh, mortality is not a problem, but definitely there is morbidity. So essentially, uh, they have a pretty much a normal lifespan. What is the uh, uh, typical drug that is most useful in these conditions? Um, you know, this uh, patient that Dr. Sony talked about respond only to minocycline. What is your Sir, I don't think there is a straightforward answer to that because it would depend on the bacteria as well. I mean to say the type of the bacteria as well as the susceptibility. As far as BCG is concerned, we know we have repeatedly discussed that pyrazinamide need not be free to drugs, including isoniazid, rifampicin, ethambutol, and sometimes leoflox. However, for other groups of atypical mycobacteria. I think it's to be individualized based on the mycobacteria and based on the susceptibility, as well as uh, we also should involve the ID expert in such situations. It is also told that mycobacterium abscesses specifically can have localized infection where surgery may have a role. And apart from this, we are not discussing even gamma therapy because available to us. However, in the West, they do use interferon gamma injection therapy uh, uh, I would say, uh, to treat such infections. There's a question, if there is other organisms that are getting in, the child is uh, predisposed to, do we have the prophylaxis? Do we have to any other drugs as prophylaxis for, from infections? Any of you question. can answer. Do we need to give prophylaxis any other uh, bacterial or fungal or uh, prophylaxis, you know, to prevent infections in these children with MS. One, one prophylaxis people paper no clear because the presentation be quite variable and some of them may have different infections. It is it, it has to be individualized. However, Discussion on the role of azithromycin in. Oh, you're breaking. Your voice is breaking, Sagar. Can't hear you. Uh, Dr. Amit, can you tell us? <laughs> Dr. Sujit, Sujit Singh, can you tell us about uh, aphylaxis for children with MSMP? Do we need to give? Yeah, I, I don't think there is a consensus on this based on our own experience. For patients with salmonella infections, we have never had to give prophylaxis. For patients with recurrent tuberculosis, yes, we have tried um, uh, prophylaxis with mixed results. Some of these patients, they have not responded in spite of prophylaxis, the reason being that we were unable to identify the species because um, uh, it's not easy to uh, identify uh, what kind of mycobacterial species um, is the um, uh, uh, is causing the problems? So in some of these patients, prophylaxis has not worked. To the best of my knowledge, there are no definite guidelines on prophylaxis because that would depend on the underlying uh, organism. So you, when you treat these patients, you give them a longish course of anti-tubercular therapy with the milder forms of MSMD. Sometimes even with one course, prolonged course, uh, they, they seem to remain well. I would be very keen to know the follow-up of Dr. Sheila's patient. Uh, because yeah. as far as, yeah, I think she was given only one course and for several years she remained well. Maybe she's still, uh, she must be a young uh, lady now. Dr. Sheila, if you could respond. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, I have I have seen her when she was 16 years old. After that, I have never seen her. 
so <laughs> she is doing perfectly uh, she is very healthy now she is studying uh, for uh, as uh, to become a staff nurse now and as you have rightly pointed out we have given treatments with the four drug therapy for one year initially that's all after that we have never given any att or any other thing and in spite of that's doing a detailed workup um, it was not possible to identify the uh, the genetic defect in this patient because even even after sending the sample to professor casanova's lab but this was done long time back around 18 years back but probably now probably it might might be possible for us to find out the mutation in her thank this, you dr shila uh, dr amit what is bcg iris amit or dr sagar what is bcg iris there is a question there i can't hear you strictly sir is, oh, yeah. sorry sorry uh, no uh, bcg iris Okay. TB iris. TB iris, yeah. Immune reconstitution. Yeah. Yeah. What does it mean with uh, regard to BCG? That's a question there. BCG, BCG iris versus disseminated BCG. Uh, so, Sagar, uh, your uh, am I audible? Yeah, it's getting it's uh, wavering your sound. Yeah, tell me. Let me change the internet. J give me a sir. Vijay, Vijay, can you tell us? Vijay Evle? Vijay Evle is here. Oh, Mukesh. Mukesh, are you here, Mukesh? So, sir, uh, am I audible now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, basically... at least see if we have seen some patients who undergo a bone marrow transplant say for a given condition where he is already received bcg and now this child is completely immunocompromised and now starts having immune reconstitution so there would be a residual bcg that is remaining at the site in the body but now what uh, you start seeing that there is ulceration at the site of bcg and this is essentially because there is a residual bacteria and the body is trying to react against it because of the immune reconstitution this is like typically described at least in a skid baby who has received bcg and has undergone a bone marrow transplant i am sure even in patients with hiv if they have mycobacterial infections and if you don't treat them and the patient is started on anti retroviral therapy their immune reconstitution would result in a inflammatory syndrome so that is what we call iris and it has been at least described well in post bmt patients patients in immunodeficiency setting here one would need to treat both uh, the bcg by giving antimycobacterial therapy and sometimes uh, some degree of immunosuppression uh, on case to case basis may need may, may be needed okay what how do you define bcg is another question uh, meaning you know all these ac accelerated bcg or bcg adenitis with uh, how, how do you do, do you go and investigate all these cases so what is the definition of a bcg simulated bcg so sir as the, i think uh, in in very much of your beginning of your presentation one of the slides clearly stated that if there is a spread of bcg uh, away from the uh, node i mean to say if you have involvement of the local site or the local no node we take, take it as lo uh, localized bcg adenitis and we don't essentially investigate such patients however if there is dissemination to a distant node or any distant site that would be taken as a disseminated bcg and uh, and would warrant an evaluation okay uh, dr anil there is a, a question here saying uh, you said something about difference between bcg in private and government sector what what is this uh, that you are alluding to anil dr yes Dr. Anil, can you hear me? There's a question about. See, you had said about this uh, is being different in the private and the government sector. What is that you are talking about? Not audible. Anybody else uh, on that? Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell yeah, me. yeah. 
the private private vaccines are made by a you uh, uses a strain called as russian strain that is serum institute of india that's the only manufacturer that provides a vaccine and the government vaccines are provided by either chennai gindi institute or the green green signal biofarm which uses a danish strain so government vaccines are all danish strain which does not produce mpt64 protein so we won't be able to identify in a culture that it is mycobacterium tuberculosis complex while the private strain the russian strain produces mpt64 if you happen to grow it in culture you can identify it as mpt the mycobacterium tuberculosis complex no. so knowledge of the vaccine given to the child is very important to identify the bacteria if you have cultured it okay there's a question to you dr anil how do you send the sample what is the sample you require for the best sample for tuberculosis is a tissue bit or an aspirate at least 0.5 to 1 ml of aspirate no swab can be used for culture and you send it in as as what you you send it as soon as possible if you think there is a delay a lag then you have to put uh, some amount of sterile saline so that it remains hydrated and doesn't get dried up how long can we keep this uh, sample you can keep it for yeah you can keep it for 24 to 48 hours but it has to be cultured as soon as possible so that the viability is maintained you can keep it in the fridge also okay dr amit there's a question how do you send your sa samples to you if you want to send it to you how uh, fast do you need to get these samples for genetic testing dr amit are you around dr amit Uh, okay, I'll take that. Ah, yeah, yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, uh, as far as samples of flow cytometry are concerned, these can be couriered, and if they can reach Amit's lab within forty-eight hours or so, we can have them processed. But in the summer months. Um, sometimes it causes problem so we always advise that along with the uh, patient sample we also send a travel control so that we can interpret it better uh, we are doing some of the genetic tests amit has a, a gene panel uh, of i think 43 genes and some amongst these genes uh, are related to msmd so he does the next generation sequencing panel uh, 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 for PID, and some of them are MSMD genes. And uh, for this, we just need some DNA. But uh, you have to fix it up with him because uh, these panels are run uh, 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 once you have a collection of say fifteen uh, to twenty patients. So what 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 is the difference between those and at the center there? and the private labs you have to, there are there are some issues that he said that there was a problem with uh, the reporting in the private labs compared to the uh, what are you doing there yeah i wish amit could have taken this up uh, amit i, I don't know uh, sagar can you help out amit was talking about uh, pro, that we need to send patient the, the sample for this patient also to yeah, him yeah 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 so basically i think the genetic test testing part uh, we can utilize private labs especially those who are in periphery because now the private lab access is quite good although it costs us around 15 to 20000 rupees but if you provide them with reliable history most of the genetic labs Uh, standard genetic labs would be able to diagnose these conditions however the challenge remains when you get a genetic diagnosis whether it is a partial defect whether it is a complete defect those functional studies these genetic labs won't be offering and that is where we will need research labs like pgi chandigarh who who can tell us whether it is a partial defect or a complete defect so i think the private labs as far as the genetic diagnosis are concerned can be relied upon provided we are also giving the and the appropriate history and the genes that we are interested in okay dr anil there's a question for you from dr rajiv bansal he is asked uh, is there any particular media that you send these cultures in no no as of now hello can you hear me yeah hello yeah tell me yeah yeah uh, we can is... hear you 
Uh, there is no particular media as such. There is no transport media for mycobacterium tuberculosis. The sample should be adequately hydrated. It should not get dried up. That is the only issue. If it gets dried up, the bacteria becomes non-viable. I think we'll uh, we'll uh, stop for now. We'll go into the quiz. I'll ask Dr. Sagar to, to initiate the quiz for the PGs. Yeah. So uh, we'll have qu a quick quiz, uh, I understand. Uh, it's quite late and these will be seven quick questions and uh, Dr. Jason has promised that he would be giving you some prize. Uh, but obviously you need to go get back to Dr. Jason, sir, for that prize. Uh, let me share my screen. Dr. Johnny, please be ready, huh? Yeah, Dr. J Johnny would help me out uh, in noting. Yeah, uh, yeah, I will not, I will not, uh, name. Yeah, so the, in the next, in the, the purpose of quiz is for the residents to, uh, to just check their attentiveness and to, for us to understand whether it has really made a difference. And um, uh, this would be a quiz where we have multiple choice uh, I'm saying multiple choices to answer. One will be the best answer and you need to answer it in your chat box. And uh, for example, the first question, if the answer is A or one, then you need to answer one dot one. That means it is the first question and the answer is one so that it is clear for the jury to understand uh, which question are you answering. And it uh, we would provide you 10 seconds for each question. So the first question, BC vaccine all are correct except it is a live attenuated vaccine given to all children below the age of five in India or you can say in developing countries it is contraindicated in immunocompromised children the th third option it is inherently re resistant to ethambutol fourth option 80 percent effective against severe forms of tuberculosis like TB meningitis but less effective in preventing pulmonary tuberculosis it should never be given in an HIV positive mother's baby although it is asymptomatic and is HIV positive. So these are the five options. Kindly answer in your chat box, which is the answer. And your time starts now. We have, I would say, 10 seconds. Everyone has got that right. Huh? Yeah, so I'm sure this is an easy one. Uh, yeah. Let's go to the next one. All the following can be associated with increased risk of disseminated BCG infection, except one. So which of the following does not have an increased risk of disseminated BCG? Severe combined immune deficiency, MSMD, X-linked A-gamma globulinemia. The last option is chronic granulomatous disease. And you have your 10 seconds. So I'm sure again, possibly this is an easier one. All it, correct. Everyone's yeah, doing let's go correct. To, yeah, your let's talk, go talk to has the been really good. Yeah, thank you, sir. So now this would really test them. Multifocal bone tuberculosis. So we are talking about predisposition to bone in this form of MSMD is a characteristic feature of which of the following. Autosomal recessive IFN gamma R2 deficiency, autosomal dominant partial IFN gamma R1 defect, the third one, autosomal recessive complete IFN gamma R1 deficiency, and the fourth one, interleukin 12 receptor beta 1 deficiency. And sure. there are, so we wait for 10 seconds. So this is a tough one and I'm sure who has heard, uh, I, I would say Dr. Amit sir's talk would be able to probably crack this one. I go to the next question, the fourth one. Which of the following is a false statement? Which one, which one of the following is false? Interleukin 12 receptor beta 1 deficiency is the most common cause of MSMD. Second one. Autosomal recessive complete IFN gamma R1 deficiency is a serious disease and is fatal in early life in the absence of bone marrow transplant. Third one, IFN gamma therapy is highly effective in autosomal recessive complete IFN gamma R1 deficiency. Fourth one, autosomal dominant.
dominant stat1 deficiency causes msmd while autosomal dominant stat1 gain of function causes chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis and your time starts now oh come on so please i would say uh, read through these lines you would get an answer here if you have understood the pathophysiology yeah, there are correct answers okay nice to know that and uh, it in the end we would be discussing these answers so as to know why which answer is correct so which of the following is true the next question question number 5 all children with skid severe combined immune deficiency have lymphopenia all children with hyper igm syndrome have increased risk of disseminated bcg infection all children with msmd need a bone marrow transplant in the last one accelerated bcg reaction with ipsilateral large axillary adenitis does not warrant an evaluation for immune deficiency and your time starts i'm sure this is another probably a easier one so, so i would go to the next question question number 6 which bcg strains are used in india first one tokyo and sweden second pasture and danish third one russian and danish and fourth one tokyo and russian and i would give you 10 seconds okay so let's go to the last question <coughs> all are true about bcg except one diluent not specific for the bcg while if used could destroy potency second the immediate reaction may last up to 10 to 15 minutes following vaccination third shaking of the while is a must before using bcg fourth potency c last for 6 hours i believe it means once you open the vial and fifth one contains 10 million cfu of bacillus the colony forming units so which one of them is not a true statement so that's the end of the quiz and uh, should we first discuss the answers or declare the winner dr jeeson dr sujit singh and you can uh, discuss the answers and then by the time uh, dr johnny will do the uh, counting yeah. yeah amit we missed you for the question on uh, uh, your testing you know yeah i am i am there yeah yeah we missed you for those questions on your testing how actually i was off for uh, my my connection was a little sloppy i was off for a while i'm sorry okay i can answer that yeah. now i can answer that now yeah, yeah the question was uh, what is the difference between your lab and private labs you said that you want to send the samples again to you because there was something defect defective in the in the reporting in the private labs that we sent uh, no i mean like most of the uh, private labs they will give you a when they do a genetic testing they will give you a variant without specifying sometimes you get a lot of uh, variant of undetermined uh, significance what you know as vus something like uh, which you don't clearly cannot uh, associate uh, with a particular disease so you have to do functional testing and functional testing is not readily available with these private labs so the flow cytometry the cytokine release assays these are all these things have their place so even if you have found a variant what is the effect of that variant for example in the stat1 gene you have one gene but the the, the mutations in different uh, types of mutations will lead to a variant phenotype for example if you have a autosomal dominant gain of function mutation it will lead to chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis if you have a loss of function mutation which is uh, 
uh, which can lead to uh, which is uh, dominant will lead to MSMD. If it is complete, it will uh, predispose to both uh, viral infections in addition to bacteria. So within the same gene, different kinds of mutations can be result in different uh, uh, disease phenotypes, clinical phenotypes. And so in these cases, what is the effect of that particular variant on the uh, the that particular uh, pathway? I mean, like to study that pathway, you will have to do this functional assays. You you have to stimulate TBMCs with certain stimulants. For example, if you want to evaluate TSTAT1, the STAT1 pathway, you will have to stimulate with FN gamma and then look whether the STAT1 is getting upregulated or, or it is not getting upregulated. And then you can know uh, whether it is a loss of function variant or a gain of function variant. Those kind of things you can only answer when you do these functional studies. Oh, good. And you, uh, Dr. Sujit Singh said within 48 hours it should reach you the sample. What do we do for the, function, for, the, for the functional assays? Yes, so for the functional assays, because you are looking at a function, so you need viable cells, you need viable cells. So that is one problem when we get samples from uh, far off. I mean, like two or three days and with these temperatures, I mean, like, there's hardly any viable cells to look for those functions. So for the functional based assays, you do require a fresh sample. I mean, preferably within six hours or at the most 24 hours, I mean, even like 48 to 72 hours, you don't know what kind of results you will get with, for the functional assays. The surface staining you can still do for a couple of days, but for the functional study, you need within a day, the sample should reach to you. So we need centers in the south also. I think uh, a lot of sam samples from the south do go to Mumbai, uh, Dr. Manisha's lab. They're doing okay. some of the functional studies here. Okay, shall we have the questions, uh, Sagar? Shall yeah. we discuss? Yeah. Dr. So Surjit the, Singh, the, are you the... there? Dr. Surjit Singh, are you Go there? Ahead. Yeah, yeah, I'm there. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. Sagar. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so the first question I, I'm sure uh, is a straightforward one. We all know it's contraindicated in immunocompromised children, is a live veterinated vaccine. And I think Dr. Jason did mention in his presentation that it is quite effective against severe forms of TB. But when it comes to pulmonary TB, uh, it may not be that effective. But the whole reason of giving BCG to young children is to protect them against the most devastating forms of tuberculosis. And he aptly mentioned in one of his last slides that the recent recommendations is to not give BCG to a HIV positive baby. So, and we have, uh, I think, multiple times discussed that BCG is resistant to pyrazinamide and is sensitive to all. So the answer to this question is question. Uh, uh, answer is three. Option number three. Uh, but nobody has answered the first question. Uh, I can't see anybody answering the first question in my chat room. Uh, oh. The one which I, because I got disconnected in between. Uh, my oh, internet. Yeah, so everyone most, is answered right. Uh, so everybody. Give you, everybody's first, answered right. Can you tell me the first yes. three who answered so, because. So, so, uh, yeah, uh, can you mention, mention the first three who answered that uh, first question? Oh, I uh, first three are Anurag Nala, 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 uh, Nila Mani, Nila Mani, Nila Mani Satish, Satish Kumar, Satish Logarathan, yeah. Satish Kumar, Nila Mani, first, first who's is the Anurag, first one? Na, na, Anurag Nala, Anurag, Anurag Nala. Nala, okay, Nila Mani and Satish Kumar, yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. So now let me go to the second question and I would uh, request, sir, uh, if we can add all the following can be associated with increased risk of uh, disseminated BCG infection. And again, here the answer is answer number three, X-linked agamoglobulinemia. Dr. Sujit Singh, can you explain the why? Yeah. In children with X-linked agamoglobulinemia, what you have are basically more infections with the uh, pyogenic uh, bacteria like pneumococcus H flu. So these are the extracellular organisms. And uh, 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 for TB, the, the typical PADs will be MSMD, severe combined immunodeficiency, and sometimes even CGD. So X-linked agamoglobulinemia, the profile of infections is completely different and a rather restricted uh, uh, repertoire of infection. May, uh, I, can I add, uh, sir, yeah. to that, that uh, apart from the extracellular bacteria, yeah. Yeah. Antiv yeah. enterovirus infections are also very, uh, uh, I mean, 
common in these patients in addition to extracellular bacteria sure so so we have the answer here that is answer number 3 so let me go to the next question and i believe this uh, the answer here where you have increased risk of getting bone tuberculosis due to atypical mycobacteria is answer number 2 autosomal dominant partial ifn gamma r1 defect i think uh, amit had a case present yeah. a case yeah. yeah yeah but it is also reported in other defects it is it is more common with this defect but as agarate said even the partial uh, dominant stat1 also can have this multifocal osteomyelitis with uh, non tuberculous mycobacteria or pcg so this is this is not characteristic but it is more common in this uh, this defect yeah so what i can say was uh, obviously I, I, i've been taught that when you read after your patients come i think you get definitely more wiser so this stat1 deficiency patient which we managed at kochi uh, definitely had multifocal osteomyelitis and the final diagnosis is autosomal dominant stat1 deficiency which is kind of again a partial defect but then it is autosomal dominant uh, stat1 deficiency in the same way here also there is a partial defect in ifn gamma r1 and somehow both of these autosomal dominant disorders with partial defects have increased risk for bone osteomyelitis yeah, yeah. so let me go to the next question which one of them is false and uh, Uh, Doctor Amit sir, uh, do you want to add to um, to discuss this slide? Yeah. Okay. So uh, IL twelve receptor beta one deficiency is definitely the most common. I had uh, dealt with that. Uh, the pie chart I had shown in one of my in my presentation. Autosomal uh, uh, recessive complete form of IF and gamma R one deficiency is definitely a serious disease. It is fatal if it is not treated with bone marrow transplant. I think uh, this was. Uh, Told in the discussion and during the treatment, uh, the IFN gamma therapy would be uh, helpful in patients with partial defects, not in patients with complete defects. So but with complete defects, uh, you no know, receptor, where functional receptor where this IFN gamma is going to act. So only in the partial uh, defects of IFN gamma R1 or R2, the recombinant IFN gamma therapy would be useful. So it will not be uh, wise to or to be. Uh, to give this therapy in patients with complete forms they would require bone marrow transplant they would not be helped with ifn gamma recombinant ifn gamma therapy because there is no functional uh, ifn gamma r1 or r2 receptor which is going to uh, where this uh, recombinant uh, protein is going to bind and to cause downstream signaling autosomal stat uh, deficiency as uh, state stat1 gain of function as i said uh, it has it is a cause for chronic mucopenic candidiasis most of the mutations here they occur in the coiled coiled domain and then uh, you have the autosomal stat1 uh, partial the autosomal dominant uh, partial stat1 deficiency that leads to msn and the complete stat1 deficiency the complete recessive form that leads to viral infections uh, in addition to uh, bacterial infections sure so the answer here is 3 3 uh, because the gamma therapy is not effective in complete deficiency because as sir explained there is no receptor and that is why you don't expect any benefit out of it and it is also interesting to note the option 4 we have discussed that same gene uh, mutation in uh, mutations can result in different diseases and our patient had stat1 deficiency autosomal dominant that caused msmd the, the next question uh, uh, dr sujit the can you uh, there was this, there was one question for dr sujit was what is gain of function and loss of function what is that uh, uh mean i think amit i would ask amit to take this up please so uh, a loss of function means that there is a, a defective function in the protein the protein either will be formed in lesser quantities or not at all depending on whether it is partial or complete or the, if the protein is formed it will be dysfunctional it will not have any uh, function whereas a gain of function means that the protein will be expressed in larger amounts and so it will have a more potent effect or it will have in the same quantity but it will have a more uh, potent functional effect so this is the difference between a loss of function and a gain of function mutation is that and, does it does it make it clear for you yeah yeah yeah, yeah sure uh, and i can also add that when you have gain of function and the 
the protein is increased naturally downstream signaling is increased and that will have the effect on the genes and the expression of those genes and that is how you get a very different disease so so let me add to that the statin gain of function uh, it it will lead to decreased production of your th17 cells because uh, stat1 and stat3 are counter regulatory so if you have a stat1 autosomal uh, dominant loss of function you have got uh, candidiasis as one of the me mechanisms and similarly if you have a gain of function you will have uh, cmc and another example is your viscotalgic syndrome uh, vas gene where a loss of function mutation will cause viscotalgic syndrome whereas if you have a gain of function mutation it will cause x linked neutropenia so in the same gene kind of defect it will have will uh, will uh, will dictate what kind of a phenotype the patient will have very good yeah so now the next question question number 5 i am sure the answer is straight forward it is answer 4 that accelerated bcg reaction with ipsilateral large uh, axillary adenitis does not warrant an evaluation for immune deficiency i think everybody has got so, that right so uh, should i discuss the yeah yeah, yeah but yeah, i would only want to add yeah i would only want to add that although majority of patients with skid have lymphopenia there is a subset of patients where the lymphocyte counts can be normal now this could be because of maternal engraftment of t cells or there are variants of skid like omen syndrome where the t cell count can be normal and they may not have lymphopenia so this is just to highlight that if you have lymphopenia please do think of skid but if the profile looks like skid there is failure to thrive candidiasis hiv is negative and even if you have a normal lymphocyte count you will have to work up them further and we have discussed that only few types of hyper igm syndrome there is increased risk of bcg because some subsets of hyper igm syndrome only have hypogamma globulinemia which are pure b cell defects like xla and they don't have increased risk of bcg and i think uh, through our discussions today we have realized that msmd uh, there are various causes only some of them need a bone marrow transplant uh, sir do you want to add anything Pro uh, professor surjit singh sir carry on carry on yeah i would like to add like in skid with the uh, yeah. with the skids which don't have lymphopenia you could have uh subsets which could be reduced like you could have the cd4 deficiency in msc class 2 deficiency or you could have a isolated cd8 deficiency in zap 70 deficiency or you could have functional defects in t cells like your stem or i where there is a, a functional uh, defect in activation of t cells where the phenotype would be like a combined immunodeficiency but the counts may be normal yeah so i think in such patients we need to do more detail Detailed uh, immunological studies. Okay. So let's go to the next question. Uh, I would ask Dr. Anil to uh, discuss this question: Which BCG strains are used in India? And if I'm right, the answer is three: Russian and Danish. Hello. The panel is not there. We'll go on to the next question. Yeah. I think everyone's got that right. Because he's mentioned again and again that the Russian and Danish are used in India. Okay, great. So the last question, uh, the answer is five, because I was told that it contains only two to eight million CFE of bacillus and not ten million, and the remaining four options seems to be okay. So the answer is five. Yeah, uh, it's important that you shake the vial. I, th I think all of you will. Uh, get a oski about uh, bcg and you must make sure that before you give it you shake it well because uh, otherwise the, you'll get dilute to the top and you won't get the amount of bacillus that in that you require in each of these uh, uh, doses that you're giving so that's important to shake then as we have said that the the wheel should be about 4 5 mm of wheel should be produced by the intradermal injection and that that last that the wheel can last more than 15 minutes and you you should use the same uh, for each uh, bcg vial you should have a se separate uh, diluent you can't use a different diluent for a different bcg uh, uh, vial because you might destroy the uh, uh, number of uh, the, the the bcg uh, if you give us a different uh, diluent and it's important to keep the diluent and the bcg at uh, 
that two, two to eight degrees centigrade. So when you're using one session, six hours. The six hours you can't keep this thing in light, in in, in uh, exposed to sunlight because it will destroy the BCG. So the potency will last six hours if you keep it out, but uh, in, in a dark place or it goes back in the refrigerator for two uh, to maintain the two to eight degrees centigrade when you're not uh, using the uh, the BCG. That these are things that we must remember when you. This will be a OSCE questions which all of all PGs would know. That's it. Sure, sir. I have stopped yeah. up sharing my screen. Yeah. Can we yeah. have the? Yeah. So we have two winners tie. We have a tie with uh, Anurag Nalla and uh, Doctor Sadish Kumar scoring four out of seven questions correctly. Very so good. we have we have a tie. We have two winners. Can they tell and us? Can, uh, uh, can Anurag tell us uh, your you know detail? You can type it uh, on the chat box, please. And uh, Dr. Sadish Kumar, please. Anyway, I think uh, that's that's it for today. I think we have gone on to it's about nine o'clock. It's Satish two hours. Satish is into... a DM here. Satish is a DM student here. He's a uh, he's a faculty at uh, CMC Vellore and now he's doing a DM at our institute. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. great. Satish Kumar. And Dr. Nalla? Anurag Nalla. He's from Belgaum. I think he's putting that in the chat box. He's better than the chat box. Okay. So That's yeah. great. So we have uh, PGs from all over India. It's because uh, Dr. Yeah, Sanjit he's Singh from all... uh, Kaili, Belgaum. So people from North Karnataka, good, good to know that. <laughs> okay. Okay, I think, uh, uh, shall we have a last word from Dr. Sujit Singh before we have uh, Dr. John, Johnny to give the word of thanks? Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, I mean, thank you for... Uh, no, wait, wait, uh, a last word by Dr. Sujit Singh before you... Yeah, Dr. Sujit Singh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I just wish to thank the IAP coaching branch for taking up this initiative. And I think we had a very lively discussion lasting almost two hours. The topic was a little esoteric, but believe me, when we get these patients, uh, you really have to work them up in great detail. And rarely can you make a bedside diagnosis. So it, it takes weeks, sometimes months of workup. You have to follow these patients up, but uh, uh, ultimately you will end up uh, with the correct diagnosis, provided your clinical suspicion is correct and you've picked up the right patient. So uh, whenever you see difficult kinds of tuberculosis, don't be in a hurry to jump on to different types of therapy. You should think twice before you launch on to a repeat course of anti-tubercular therapy, or if the patient is not responding, just don't keep on adding drugs. Uh, there is very likely an underlying primary immune deficiency. So thank you very much, Dr. Jason. Um, it's been a pleasure interacting with... We are all so, so thankful to all the speakers. I think Dr. Johnny will say his word of thanks. Please, Johnny. Uh, thank you all for... I mean, on, on behalf of Kochi IPI, I, I thank all, uh, everyone with, uh, from the bottom of my heart uh, for, for, for all the excellent talk and the academic speech we had, especially Professor Sujit Singh, uh, sir, and uh, Dr. Anil Kumar uh, talking about the microbiology. Dr. Sagar, but uh, talking about disseminated BCG and immune deficiency. And obviously, Dr. Jason Nitsar is, you know, uh, uh, moderating the session and also presenting the wonderful case. And also Dr. Amit Rawat uh, on discussing about the pathophysiology. The, the all went really well and was very, I, it's a, uh, they were all eye-openers for us, especially because this immune deficiency is not something that you come across very commonly. But yeah, definitely as uh, Professor so these things uh, said, uh, said uh, you know, you uh, once you are aware of these conditions, yeah, obviously we will think of uh, and. Uh,